Yeah. Okay. So we're tying your crowd so we can be more interactive. I'm Colin, and I'm going to give you a little bit about what I've actually learned from working in a distributed, remote, and virtual company. Companies. I have the uh, ability to tell you I've never actually worked in an office before in my life. Maybe some of you have that same ability. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I intend to keep it that way. I've moved around a bit, but I've more or less worked on the same thing for 15 years. Uh, at MySQL, I lived in Melbourne at home. I worked on the database server. At Sun, they acquired us. I lived at home in Kuala Lumpur this time. I moved from Melbourne. And it was a new concept for Sun Malaysia for people to work in at home as opposed to not going to an office. It was kind of common at you know, Sun in the US, but definitely work from home was not a common thing for them. Sun obviously does not exist, but many open source projects you may have seen or used uh, possibly came from Sun. Shortly after that, I started on this new thing called MariaDB Server, so I was on the founding team right up until um, autumn last year. Does anybody use MariaDB Server? Heard of MariaDB Server? Yeah, okay. So um, we, we also managed to obviously work at home. So Monty Program was a company of maybe 15 developers, one um, admin staff, the, we would call her Mama because she would be the person who paid our bills. <laughs> It's quite important. And uh, the, rest, the rest of us just stayed at home in various places. Then it merged with, with another company called SkySQL, who also more or less just kept sitting at home, and MariaDB Corporation. And now I work at Percona, where we do all things MySQL and MongoDB. So we've been around for 10 years. And I work in the CTO office. Uh, so I still do dabble a little bit on engineering the MySQL server. I'd love to work more with MongoDB server, but I haven't had much time on that. So I know at least one gentleman here uses MongoDB. Do other people use it too? <laughs> okay. And yeah, everything we do is we, we make 100% open source tools. And that was actually one of the main reasons <coughs> why I moved is to make open source tools. And um, I'm sure there are many talks by Red Hat here as well and the Fedora project largely run also remotely, not only even for Red Hat staff, but also for the community. So I reckon that open source communities uh, totally understand working from home. So if you come from an open source world, working from home should be easy for you because you know, you, this is typically what you end up doing, right? You find some software, you, you most likely download it, you, you probably don't read the documentation, but maybe you compile it, or nowadays you use packages, and, you, and if it's good software, you typically will get you know, started in, in less than five minutes. So you know, the MySQL install rule was download, get started in, in typically less than 15 minutes. MongoDB, I think, has taken this further with, with less than five minutes. So there, there are, of course, benefits to this in the sense that you can get started developing in a very quick fashion. But there are, of course, disadvantages in the sense that maybe you, you make defaults be simple and easy so you have say weak security models and then you get these press releases saying 40,000 MongoDB instances hacked. That's not because you know MongoDB is bad, it's just because it was configured by default to be fairly insecure and <coughs> maybe about a, a month ago you'd see the same thing coming out from my, the MySQL world, right? A bunch of them got encrypted and then you're supposed to pay some Bitcoin to get them decrypted and you know I think we've got MongoDB users here, you've got MySQL users here, and you know, give it some time and maybe Postgres users are here, but probably in a couple more months you'll see that even though they're of a higher order, I would say that uh, you'll probably find Postgres databases hacked and similar story. Anyway, sometimes you join a mailing list. If you like the project enough, you use the project enough. If you also join the IRC channel, though I should probably scratch IRC and say that nowadays lots of open source projects start to use Slack. Uh, and I don't know why, really, because Slack just takes up more memory, for instance. But it seems to be a common thing. Um, 
and then sometimes you find that you need to make a patch, so you you make a patch. Sometimes you just file a bug, which is good. And sometimes you evangelize products to friends. And you know, this conference has actually, uh, for many years, had huge chunks of people from Mozilla because Mozilla would uh, sponsor their their visits here. And I think uh, Firefox is one really good example of corporate back evangelism that works out quite well. I don't know if they, they're still here this year. Big, big Mozilla track? Yeah, okay, so, that, so they are still here this year, okay. All of this more or less forms um, what is referred to as the architecture of participation, where you have a system designed around communication protocols that are more or less instinctively designed for participation. So generally, anyone can participate. You become first class, and but, but participating is a first class thing to do. And I think the web really opened participation to software development. Outside of just software development, it's also to all users of the system. So I didn't coin this phrase. This was coined by Tim O'Reilly, but he himself didn't coin this phrase because he'd learned it from someone else. But what this sort of gives you is a network effect of, of things. So. Open source communities are very rarely formed outside of a specific office or a room, and they don't, they don't, you know, that's what maybe an open source product may be, but doesn't mean an open source project will be like that. In terms of open source projects, people tend not to care about time zones, they tend not to care about weekends. So you know, a very good example is nowadays GitHub has this punch card system. You want to see if, a pro if, a, if something open source on GitHub is a project or a product, look at the punch cards. If it's a product, it's usually Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, or 9 to 6. No, you don't agree? No, no, no. <laughs> and, if you, and, if you, and if you look at uh, a project, you tend to find sporadic hours. So it, it can range from 6 in the morning till 12, 1 in the morning. And it'll be Monday to Sunday. like. Every day of the week, you get commits. And that's one of these uh, cool things that I, I started looking at when I want to evaluate if an open source project is actually a project and not a product. Because if, an open, if it's an open source product and it's you know, commercially backed, you want to be very careful that they may change the license on you, or they may do other nasty things on you down the line, which they all can do, by the way, especially if you sign a contributor agreement saying, hey, I'd like to you know, give you joint copyright. Contributor agreements in that sense usually are not, not so good. Open source projects very rarely care about you going to an office. Sure, they have summits, so you know if you're a very large open source project, uh, Ubuntu was a good example of this. They'd have these Ubuntu summits every six months. I think it got so large that they decided they had to stop doing that in person, but now they do it online. And uh, Debian still has DebCons, where people go at least once a year somewhere nice. But you don't really need to go to DebCon to contribute to Debian. You can do that effectively from your, your home. And I'm guessing all of you must have seen this wonderful video of this, um, South, this uh, professor in South Korea who was talking on the BBC, and his kids started running in. And more or less, I'd say, you know, minus all the jokes, that's how a lot of open source projects uh, still communicate, right? You can still have Hangouts. You can still work via Skype video. Yes, I know Skype is not open source, but I'm, I'm sure most of you have used it at least once. It's quite useful software. Um, do you pick up the phone to call someone in an open source project to say, hey, I think you need to do this? It's almost unheard of. You tend to work in an asynchronous fashion. And meetings. Every minute you avoid spending in a meeting is a minute you can get real work done instead. This is Jason Fried in the book Rework. He is the founder of 37 Signals, who now call themselves Basecamp. They've built a company that's profitable. They're proud about it. And uh, they've even contributed, obviously, to Ruby on Rails because David Hanemeyer Hansen works, works there. He's also the co-founder of the company. They've never taken a single cent of, of venture investment. I think they might have sold some portion of the company to Jeff Bezos, but they're very happy building stuff. Also, fa in a fairly asynchronous fashion where people do get to work at home. So, are all of you working in a company 
in an office? Do you go to an office on Monday? Out of curiosity, who who goes to an office on Monday? Okay, so the rest of you don't go to an office at all, or? <laughs> Ah, okay. Yeah. Once or twice a week. Once or twice a week. So you're, you're mostly remote then? Yeah, okay. trying to be even more remote. Excellent. So, so, so we have some good tips for that, right? Because if most people are remote, that, that actually is a bonus. But if some people end up sticking in the office, that's obviously a problem. So yeah, so many of you do go to the office. But if you want to think about it, you know, companies shouldn't be any different from open source projects. If open source projects can can give you what runs the internet today, like the Linux kernel is not developed in an office. Um, ne neither is you know the, the GNOME environment that you may use. Neither are you know many <coughs> web frameworks for websites you use. I, I don't see why this can't work in you know companies. So it's very clear that you need to have a very clear stated goal of what you aim to achieve. So I can pick from what I know, which is say MySQL. MySQL's stated goal was make superior database management available and affordable to all. This is a, a vision, a mission, a goal. And if that goal meant adding features that would effectively make it a little bit more competitive to say Oracle, maybe you know, make it, or making it more a, a real database, <coughs> that, that was something that one would have to do over time. MariaDB server, we chose community developed, feature enhanced, and backward compatible. Those were our themes for a very long time. And as for Pagoda server, we just sell it as an enhanced drop-in replacement to MySQL where your queries may run faster, you'll troubleshoot without guesswork. So our ideas and goals are, are, are very, very much stated. So we just focus on certain things like manageability and so forth. And that, that is probably very important, not just for uh, piece of software, but also for a company that plans to work remote. Because you all have to be working t with a stated mission and a vision. So distributed workforce. I highly recommend you establish a distributed workforce early on. Because once you've got people sitting in an office, it's going to be much harder to get them out of the office. Distributed workforces, I found, are great for development teams. So if you're in engineering, there's absolutely no reason for you to wake up in the morning, drive to work, or take public transport, work from nine to five, and come back. You might as well save that commute time and do something better with, or maybe work more even. Uh, it also works very well for consulting organizations because you know, your bread and butter is obviously being with a client. If you are sitting in the office, you're probably not actually making money, which is kind of the goal of, your, of consulting. It also works well for training. So on-site trainers, um, it's clear that you shouldn't be sitting in an office. Otherwise, the sales team isn't actually doing a good job selling your training. And support. If you're doing you know, follow-the-clock the support, is there any reason for you to be doing this outside of your home? You could be sitting at home. You could use frameworks. You know, there are plenty of tools that help you do 24 by 7 support at home, like Zendesk. And uh, you know, if you want more <coughs> the open source equivalents, you can obviously, obviously use things like Eventum. Um, to some extent, Jira would work. Jira's not open source, though. So you don't really need to be sitting in an office. Sales. Unless you're inside sales, is there really a reason why you're sitting in the office or at home? You should be out there doing whatever. You know, I don't know if it's playing golf. I don't think open source salespeople get to play golf much, to, to be fair to them. But you should be out visiting people. I would admit, though, that it's definitely a bit more challenging if you're in finance and admin because you have to send out contracts, you have to keep contracts. There is lots of paperwork involved. And maybe the next talk after this by Virgil from Legalese would be a bit more helpful because everything would be more um, more digital, so to speak. Sure, you can get people to sign things digitally, but you still need to keep, you know, those those scan or in even the scanned receipts and so forth. You still need to keep them somewhere. And typically, people need some kind of physical address, because the bank wants to know that you actually have an office, and so does every other provider, so to speak. Human resources, you you have to you you have many tools today. There are tools like. Bamboo HR that can handle human resources quite well. Um, 
but sometimes maybe they also need to sit in the office. I, it's, it really is dependent. I, I don't think they need to, but I, I found human resources people tend to want to sit in offices. Um, management. So if management comes from an open source mindset I, or from a technical background, I have a feeling that they're quite happy to work at home. But if management comes from traditional organizations, they most likely want centralized management of some sort. So, you know, again, back from experience with MySQL, we had uh, centralized management in California, uh, and the human resources actually run out uh, of a small office in Sweden. Uh, but, and, and that was it. Everyone else worked at home. So 90% of the people, I'd say, worked at home. MariaDB started off with distributed management, uh, though it is now sort of coalescing in California. Uh, and Pocona, Pocona has followed the centralized management model because we have a, a huge office in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, that's where you know, the, the payroll people and, and so forth sit. So there's also social aspects of you actually working in a distributed uh, environment. Culture. You have to come from a culture that actually wants to do independent work, I think. So working cultures definitely differ in Europe, <coughs> Asia, America. When you speak to people, sometimes you're very direct, depending on what culture you come from. Sometimes you're extremely polite, so you, you don't say no, even if you mean no. Um, I mean, some cultures, they have wine with lunch. That's considered normal. Some cultures have drinks after work. Culture definitely plays a role if you're going to be successful in doing this uh, distributed workforce thing, because People not only have to work asynchronously, you also have to have trust of them actually working asynchronously. Which brings me to the next thing, which is trust. You definitely have to be a self-motivated, self-starter to sit at home to work. Otherwise, it is all too easy to say, look, I'm going to DJ tonight. I'm going to come home at 4 in the morning. I'm going to crash, wake up at noon. I'm going to be fairly demotivated after my DJing to actually work on some software, especially if I had to do quality assurance on a database server. And then I'm going to get out again at 6 o'clock to start warming up for my DJ gig tonight. This, this can happen. So, so you obviously need metrics to know how people are performing. It's quite easy from a software development standpoint because it's not just, you can also look at check-ins, you can see how many bugs are being closed. If you're meant to do QA, you can see how many tests are being written. There are always ways to sort of manage this, so to speak. Cultural backgrounds. Um, what, it, what about when people don't speak the language you expect them to speak? So you want to hire in, you're based in Singapore and you want to hire in the Ukraine. And yes, they, they can more or less do reading of English, but maybe they don't write English so well. You need to provide support for that sort of thing as well, which is the being able to communicate. Home countries also. This, this does play a role as to where they're based, because if you know, suddenly they were based in the Ukraine, maybe they'd like to relocate at some stage, and you'll have to think about supporting them. Definitely self-motivated. You need to also want to be in a collaborative work, work, work environment. You cannot always say, wins are going to be mine. I am going to be you know, the I in team, and so forth. Th those kind of people are, are very, very hard to work with in a, in a remote fashion. It's also very grating to work with in a remote fashion. And so I speak English natively, and I use to use a lot of colloquialisms, because you do that if you've learned English as a native language. Colloquialisms don't translate to other people who have learned English as a second language. So you definitely want to avoid that. So I've, I spent many years trying to avoid colloquialisms because you can't tell someone you don't want to be the, the, the square peg in a round hole because they think, they, they, they take it literally, what is a square peg in a round hole and doesn't make any sense any longer. So throwing away idioms and proverbs may not be a bad thing. 
You also definitely don't want to be passive aggressive. This, this is a way to kill working remotely. It, what does it mean to be passive aggressive? So um, instead of me actually telling you, hey, I think this is bad, I'll say, well, you know, I, I think this could have been done better. Uh, or, or if I want to give you, throw some shit at you, I'll say, you've done some great work here, but the but is the famous, this is where you need to fix yourself. And then you might end with, but keep up the good work, which, which clearly now does not mean you kept up the good work from the start, or it was that problem where I was being kind of passive aggressive, saying you're doing a good job at being bad. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I think when you write as well, so when you speak, you can be, you can clearly know if you're being passive aggressive, but when you write, I would say tone and nuance definitely gets lost in writing. So if you are writing to people who don't speak English as a first language, this is maybe not so good. Emotion obviously doesn't translate well into text, even though there are emojis nowadays. Um, and I think the other really important thing that most people who work at home forget is that you need to have a work-life balance. At MySQL, we used to say, we would only hire you if you had a pet, or a girlfriend, or a boyfriend, some significant other that would keep you grounded, because that would be motivation for you to go have a life, but that would also be motivation for you to work. You needed, you needed a balance. I mean, sometimes you have a tough day, wouldn't it be nice to just walk the dog somewhere or go out for you know, a little, little drink so, and so forth? Sometimes people say they can't focus. You know? Isolation cause, causes them the, the, the ability to not focus. Nowadays, you have the ability to go to a co-working space or a hacker space, so life is actually quite simple. And yes, you can subsidize going to a co-working space, just like you can subsidize going to a gym. In fact, some insurance providers, I don't know if this is happening in Singapore, but in London, some insurance providers actually give you an Apple Watch and they subsidize your insurance based on how much activity you report to them from your watch. It's hmm? it's crazy. Well, I expect that will happen everywhere, give, given enough time. I mean, this is $249. You could save that money. You could save on insurance. Like, who doesn't want to save money? <laughs> like the car of black books. Yeah, yeah. But it also keeps you like on the hamster wheel. But also, remember, Active people work better at home. They, because you can't just sit down there for 12 hours, you'll be a zombie and you'll gain lots of weight. So this is a, a pair of boxer shorts with the MySQL logo on it. You probably can't find this anywhere except on the internet. Uh, <laughs> and I probably have one at home. But we, we did say we'd like you to work from anywhere. So sample, that's not me. So remote has advantages, clearly. For one, you can hire great talent from anywhere. You don't have to worry about visas. You don't have to worry about uprooting them from your families. If you have great talent sitting in the mountains somewhere near India, they could work on a project that happens in Singapore, even. And, uh, and I mean, who wouldn't want to live near a mountain in India compared to well, Singapore's a nice place. I'll, I'll pick on Kuala Lumpur now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I think that's one of the, the major things that we, we learned all along is why not hire from anywhere and everywhere? You don't have to be in one location. The idea from, that you can work from anywhere, this lets employees who have aspirations to move also move. So we've had people who move from Australia to move to Thailand. I mean, who doesn't want to move from Australia to Thailand, spend a few months there and then find your life? And then, one, and then we've had people move from there after that in the middle to Sweden, and they've you know, decided to become resident there. One moved to Canada to end, end up you know, starting a new life there. But you could never do that if you were constrained to work in an office. You would never you know, pack up and move. It's also quite liberating to give people the opportunity to go to a new place for a couple of months where they can work in the mornings, enjoy themselves in the afternoons, and maybe work a little bit again in the evenings. I know Bali is a famous spot for people to, to drop by, and uh, I've got a bunch of friends there now as well, so I myself will go visit them in a couple of weeks. And Chiang Mai, so working from anywhere is awesome. 
You set your own work schedule. This is actually how to work remotely. You say, I am available for these core hours, and you can always reach me then. But any, out of the core hours, I may be available. And nowadays, it's getting harder to say you can't be available. In those days, you could say IRC doesn't run on your mobile phone, but now Slack does. So being, being available is now going to be a more common thing. And there's no more excuses that you don't have data, you don't have a smartphone. I mean, come on, that all of you have smartphones with data packages. So I would still advise core hours. So I'm around, say, for four hours every time in this time zone, when I'm in this time zone. And otherwise, I may be around, but I'll still be working for the full eight hours. And of course, time zones can follow the sun. So if you're running a support organization, you need 24 by 7 support. So do you put people on shifts, or do you just hire one in America, one in Europe, and one in Australia? then you've got 24 by 7 support. It's so much more efficient than putting people on shifts, paying overtime. It's, it's, it's healthier even. That's definitely good for support organizations. Harvard Business Review and Forbes also said that if people who work remotely are 50% less likely to quit, 87% more engaged than their peers, and nearly two times more likely to say they love their jobs. Who loves their job? Okay, I was expecting way more hands. <laughs> okay. I reckon that working at home will definitely give you the ability to lead a higher quality of life because you can go to the bank when you want to. You don't go to the bank because banks open from 9 to 5 when you're at work. You can do groceries when everyone else isn't doing groceries. So you, d you actually reclaim time, right? You, do you don't do groceries on Saturday when everybody's at the grocery store. And you're not stuck in a commute grind, which... In Singapore, may not be so bad, but you know I'm staying out at a hotel, which takes 45 minutes in, in public transit or 15 minutes in a in a in an Uber. So, you you really do reclaim time if you're going to live here. You probably use public transit more than Uber, I'm guessing. The other one thing that I didn't put here on the slides was that hiring remote also increases diversity, and diversity may not be a huge thing here, but it's it probably is an extremely huge thing, say, in the US, where you really want to hire diverse people. You want, you want not only diverse people, but you also want them from, from different sexes and so forth. So diversity allows you to do what you want so you don't have to worry about you know, showing up to work and people being odd and so forth. I've also recently seen, maybe in the last couple of weeks, a lot of highlights on this thing called the remote year. And while I think remote has its advantages, the remote year project, which you know, takes you to a new country once every month, I don't think that's quite um, what I was aiming for when I, when I proposed this talk, because that, that is more like a, a booze-filled cruise that takes you to 12 different places that allows you to just party uh, under the guise of working remotely. Yeah? So, so if you're thinking that I was referring to remote year, I'm definitely not. So communications. Hmm. That's weird. Everyone here uses something like Git, GitHub, possibly. So Git, GitHub definitely allows you to make communications much easier than you'd expect. You can, do, you can even file requests on GitHub and so forth. Slack, Slack can be your water cooler, but you cannot have two water coolers. So, so if you go to work two days a week and you spend the other three days at home, but there is really a water cooler at the office, then Slack is not the water cooler, and that's a problem. You, need to, you can only have one water cooler, not multiple water coolers. If you want to do stand-ups, which is basically figuring out what you've done yesterday, you know, or last week, or last month, you can do stand-ups effectively on, on Slack. Um, this idea of chat ops, which allows you to do deployments, see what's been committed and so forth, this has been running very well on Slack for multiple organizations. You can even discuss support tickets. So if you are familiar with something like Eventum or Zendesk, and you choose to, before writing to the customer to see you know, what, what may be it, you can also discuss it with your colleagues. So something like Slack or IRC is great for this sort of thing. Email. Email, as much as people hate it, is actually still an awesome tool. How many of you here don't use email? That's what I thought. Everyone uses email, right? 
because it, it works. But email works in an asynchronous fashion, and that's also really good from a remote standpoint. Jira. Um, we've seen a lot of people start using Jira. It's, even though it's, you know, as I said, not open source, but it's free for open source projects. It's a nice piece of kit. You can handle project management quite well, and you can do lots of communications, and you can tie it in with Git commits as well. For some reason, I seem to be going back. It's very weird. And then there's Confluence, which you can get as part of the whole package from Atlassian and Google Sites. Google Sites, not so great in terms of collaborative, even though it comes from a search company. Google Drive, I definitely see lots of people use Google Drive now very actively. So I think this, this sort, of, sort of has won because it, you can do collaborative docs, spreadsheets, and so forth. And tools definitely evolve over time. And then there's also Skype and Google Hangouts. In fact, now when you make a, a meeting with Google Calendar, it probably automatically gives you a Google Hangout link. So you can actually immediately communicate fairly quickly. So all I can say is tools tend to evolve. If I give this talk in three years' time, none of some of these tools may have changed tremendously, but I'd probably be willing to bet that email will still be there. Slack may actually be replaced by IRC. I, and you know, maybe the, the new hotness will not be something like Jira any longer or, or Google Drive, I don't know. Face-to-face -face is still important, even especially if you're a remote worker. You want to see who you've hired. The f when I got hired at MySQL, I only met my manager six months after we had, we had started working together. And that, and, th and this was before you, the times where you could do Skype video. There was no Google Hangouts. So we really just did phone calls or Skype calls and text communications. Don't skimp on company and team meetings. Team meetings should probably happen at least twice a year if you're going on a cadence of actually releasing software every six months. Company meetings could happen once a year and it's really good for teams to interact with each other. Yes, this does get expensive as your company grows larger. But even spending sometimes up to a million dollars could be extremely useful for, for morale. And there's some very good companies that talk about how they've achieved this. Buffer was one of the first to start doing this. I think they even started part of their experience here in Singapore. But Automatic is a very large company, and they are more or less all remote. And they're the makers of WordPress, and they definitely still do company meetings in person. This is the one time you don't skip on in-person meetings, I, I would say, is definitely do meetings. Of course, that also requires some planning because travel is not as easy as people think. You can't have visa restrictions. So I'm, I'm happy that I come from a place where I can go pretty much anywhere, but that's not true for many of my colleagues. So sometimes people view travel as a burden. And companies like Buffer, where they're smaller, can actually say, look, you can actually travel for longer than just that one week that you're there. You spend several weeks at, at a venue. I highly recommend uh, monthly all-hands calls. This is the time where you share information about how your company is progressing. Uh, at MySQL, we call it Radio Sakila. The Sakila was the name of the dolphin. We continue this co concept even at Percona, where there are monthly all-hands all calls so that people can join the call to see what the company's been doing for the last month and what's possibly going to be doing next month. This is probably extremely important if you are completely remote. Taking time to attend a call is, is useful and of course make recordings. Weekly CEO calls. If, you, if you're more than 70 to 100 people, it is very likely that the CEO may even have an assistant of some sort. And it is very clear that the CEO has to manage a lot of people. So having a call every week to just talk to people, let them do Q&A is not a bad idea. Google Hangouts are great for team meetings. And I, I, I think nowadays team meetings is great because you get to see someone's face or seeing six people's face. It's kind of nice to know that they're all there, they're present, and they're listening to the meeting. So. Hangouts is actually good for this. I'm not sure if Skype actually does multiple yeah. videos. They do now? They do. Okay. You have to pay for it though. You have to pay for it. Ah, 
Okay, so in that case, Google Hangouts clearly wins because you can have tons of people sitting in one room. Hangouts actually, they just announced that they're changing the corporate offering. It's called Hangout, like Hangout meeting or something like that. Oh. You can now support up to 30 people on a single Hangout. Brilliant, which is all you need really for a team meeting. I mean, you don't really have teams of 30 people, <laughs> possibly. Harmonize your benefits policy. This includes vacations. You can't say Europeans get 35 days because law states so, and Americans get 14 days because law states so, and Singaporeans get 10 days because the law states so. That's just not fair. Give everybody the same vacation days because that will make the Singaporean who normally gets 10 love working for you because you're now getting 25 and that American who normally gets 14 love working for you because you, he now gets double the vacation time. It doesn't cost you anything really. That morale benefit, very useful. Always pay for internet and mobile bills. That's a, a clear thing. Co-working space bills to defray the cost of co-working space. This definitely helps prevent isolation. So I, I'd say pay for that. Definitely you need a hardware budget. You can't say things like, I'm going to provide hardware out of one, one venue and you know, I'd like to charge the corporate credit card. They have an Apple store nearby. If they want to buy a Mac, let them buy a Mac. You know? Something sensible like, what is a sensible hardware budget when you join the company? 2,000 euros? That seems, I don't know, kind of reasonable, presumably. You want to always remind everyone about asynchronous communication. Now, this really is very important, especially if you have some sets of people working in an office. Because if they are working in an office, they think that if they're in the office, you should be in the office. If this spreads over time zones, that, that feeling is the same. So everyone needs to be reminded that communications happens asynchronously, unless you know, they booked you for a meeting and so forth. Synchronous communication does not work if you're going to work remotely. It's just, it's just not impossible. You want to document really, really heavily. If it is not written, it really doesn't exist. You don't want to go into documentation paralysis, but you definitely want to document heavily. Because it's so easy to say, well, this person said this over the phone. Oh, I found this on one, Sla on one IRC log. Well, it's becoming easier with Slack now that you can search Slack but you have to pay Slack for that feature, otherwise it loses messages after 10,000 or something. So document heavily. Company culture has to be made extremely clear inside of documentation as well. This includes the values, which we talked about earlier, your company history, because people are gonna join and not remember what happened at that meeting six years ago. And it's much better that they realize what, what came out of that meeting six years ago than to hear it from people at the bar going, oh yeah, I remember this thing happening. Not cool. And of course, there is constant evolution with culture. It, doesn't, it is not stagnant. Culture evolves if it's, if it's gonna get better. Processes must be extremely clear. There must be decision makers. You must have a process around conflict resolution. At MariaDB, where you have pe people working at a corporation committing code, and also out in the community, about half of the co committers are community members. You need to be able to know how to, to actually say, look, this is a bad commit. How do you do that? If you are a core committer or a captain, so to speak, you now have the ability to say, even if someone gets paid to work on this, they're writing junk. And that's okay. That's perfectly good. And lots of open source projects obviously have this free BSD as the idea of a core committer. In, in the Linux kernel environment, if you commit code, you have a voice. If you just give hyperbole, they give you a real pain in the, it, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. I mean, Linus will, will lart at you and he will scold you and so on, if he even bothers to reply. So um, some, some form of conflict resolution definitely makes sense. And also, one other thing, another quote from David Hanabai Hansen is make sure there isn't an advantage of being in the office and no disadvantage of being remote. And this is especially true when you have an office where sometimes you're remote and not everyone shows up at the same time and so forth. This is extremely, extremely important. 
which is why the tools matter, working asynchronously matters as well. Now there's one thing I didn't really talk about here up here in decision makers because holacracy has been something that has been pushed forward. I think uh, Zappos really uh, started implementing it. And I think holacracy is, is useful if, you, if everyone grasps the concept of it. And again, there you need to document heavily because if you know someone has a role and that person who normally may handle that role is not there, someone else should take over said role. There are thankfully a bunch of resources out there as well for this, right? One of them is an essay by Paul Graham, which is Mean People Fail. It's a short essay, it'll take you 15 minutes to read, but it more or less tells you it's nice to not be a mean person. Even though that's what they tell you you need for success, maybe. I'm sure many of you have seen, read articles or seen movies that portray Steve Jobs as being a complete a-hole. And, and if he is an a-hole, he succeeded. Huh? But maybe he was not really as mean as people think he was. There are contrary beliefs as to, as to that as well. Or maybe he did not succeed. Or, or maybe he did not succeed. <laughs> yes, or, or that, yes. Or maybe he succeeded uh, despite the fact. Or, or, or maybe, this, yes. And, and, and that may be like one in a million scenario, right? So you can't always be, expect to be the outlier. In, in this in the situation, so I, I highly recommend people to read that. Rework is both Jason Fried's and David Hadamard Hansen's book on how they are thinking about work differently, and then they they, they followed up with a book called Remote, which was uh, which is a book about how they don't have a, they don't require an office. They have an office in Chicago, you can drop in, but they more or less tell you you don't need to be there, and they hire extensively around America and the world to work at, uh, at, at what is now called Basecamp, not 37 Signals. And of course, there's the other one book that I'd highly recommend that would fall under the Mean People Fail category, and it's, it's titled The No Asshole Rule. It's now in its, I, I believe, second edition. It's obviously a little longer read, maybe it's two or 300 pages long, but if you're gonna work remotely, because you don't see the person's face all the time. And if, you, if the person frustrates you, you just maybe feel like it's much easier for you to type bad, nasty things and be more aggressive. Um, that's one of the advantages of, of re reminding yourself that in the no asshole rule is that by not seeing people, it doesn't mean you have to be a mean person. And it has, it's obviously filled with huge chunks of tips on how to you know, interact with people in person as well as, as remotely. And it's not, it's not the, the happy-go-lucky kind of book where you get from, you know, like Dale Carnegie, which is the win friends, influence people scenario. This one's actually, it's actually useful. And it's something we recommended people to read even at MySQL the moment it came out. So we would allow people to, to buy the book and expense it, which is another great thing to do, I guess. It's a tradition we still continue till today at, uh, at Procona, and I, I've seen this happen even at, uh, say, Legalese, which is what Virgil will talk about later. Is it's actually a, a wonderful thing to let people read the same things you've read um, and allow them to expense it even if, if it's not available in a, in a central resource somewhere. It's, it's clear that reading will broaden minds. So with that, I like to say thank you. I've finished a little earlier than the actual cutoff time, but since we are small, we could also open this up to a little bit of discussion since, as I said before at the start, I have never worked in an office before. Everything I've worked on has been completely remote. So I can give you anecdotal evidence of how it is to work remotely, even with people that work in an office. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, one is uh, simple. Is do you use OKR in your current company? Or do we use OKRs? Yes. So we definitely do use uh, OKRs. So those are like uh, key results and objectives that you're expected to achieve. We set OKRs to a, a basically a three-month uh, cycle because three months is a quarter. And actually, the OKR method we use is the is the Rockefeller Rocks method. And there's also a book about this. Uh, I think you can buy it on Amazon for b maybe like seven or eight bucks. And uh, more or less, you pick three to five important <coughs> things that you're going to achieve in, in those three months. 
And from there, based on how you've achieved it, at the end of the three months, there will, there will be a bonus payout, right? So a quarterly bonus is another great motivator. And in a, in a way, many people probably do it because you get employed for on a 12-month salary scale unless you're in Australia. And this quarterly bonus is, will actually help give you that 13-month salary, which is what you're supposed to be getting anyway, plus more. So yes, we definitely do do OKRs. How are we managing OKRs? Uh, you, you know, previously we tried this, this Google Drive thing, we used to have a doc. Uh, now, lately, we've also started using uh, Asana. Asana seems to be quite a useful tool. You can update st status, you can give tags to things, so it's, it's quite simple. But I, I would say any, any tool makes sense, but OKRs definitely make sense, as do weekly reports. So I didn't, I didn't mention that either, but a weekly report of what you did, your top achievements, your key, uh, your key achievements, your, what you're going to achieve next week, what you're waiting for. I think that's especially important because if you know a blocker, uh, it's probably worth stating said blocker. And uh, your key good vibrations, you know, like stuff that may not be related to work but may, may require celebrating something. Like, celebrate a partner's birthday yesterday, got sloshed, awesome time. Uh, so that other people could maybe wish you if they read it. And send that to a central mailing list, right? So that everyone gets to see what people are doing if they care. So OKRs definitely make sense. Any other questions? You yes. talked about harmonizing benefits. Yes. Um, how do you feel about like, companies like Buffer and GitLab don't have harmonized salaries? So You're right. So yeah, I've seen Buffer and GitLab not harmonize benefits, and I've also seen companies like you know Percona, uh, MySQL, and even MariaDB where we did. And I'd say that uh, in terms of employee retention, we seem to retain employees for forever. I mean, it's 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 hard to get them to to to, to leave. Actually, I I don't see turnover being high. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but if you've already hired for fit, you've hired good performers, not having to replace them every second year is, is probably a good thing. So, yeah, I was actually yeah. talking about salaries. So, so, yeah, so. yeah, so Buffer doesn't harmonize salaries, yeah, they've, and they've been quite open about that, that fact that they also look at locale. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's, that's superbly positive, especially in the Buffer sense where everything is open. <laughs> Um, at, le at least for us, everything is not, op not, not that open, as in we don't broadcast the salaries of everyone. That, that is uh, challenging. <coughs> but I think in the buffer sense, that, that could definitely be a problem for you know, employee retention. But it may also be, it may also, you know, because, because then you're actually basically saying, look, you are getting a salary based on, on your birth lottery, which is not fair. And, and will, will Buffer, I, and I don't know if Buffer has addressed this before, will Buffer say if I was employed in Cambodia at Buffer to be a happiness engineer, I think that's what they call their support people, right? And I decided that my life goals now did not want me to live in Cambodia any longer. Like, I was, I was tired of the Angkor Wat. I'd like to now live in Singapore. Will they now increase my benefits? Or will they tell me I have to live in Singapore on my Cambodian salary? At which point that would, I, I think it might actually even be impossible to do. So I, I don't know if they actually help you grow as an employee or not. Because I, I've not read them mention that. But we have had people who want to live, leave Australia, to go to Thailand. And it's great for them, right? If, you're, if you've earned a, a salary that started in, off in Australia and you live in Thailand, you live like a king. And then, and then they move to Sweden where... <laughs> Where, where then you need to start thinking about increasing salaries again, right? And the company needs to support your aspirations as well. Because you, you are not, you're not just a machine, a resource to support the company's aspirations. And of course, I, I will have to admit that if you, you know, get hired in the Ukraine or you know, Russia, you may get paid a little less than, than someone else. But the benefits in terms of your vacation days are, are good, are, are the same. Your benefits in terms of reimbursing for healthcare would be the same. And your salary would most definitely be probably in the top 15% of, of the job you're doing in, in, say, Russia compared to anywhere else. 
and it really does work from a retention standpoint from what I've seen anyway like literally I mean they say people who are who are young millennials like probably all of us in this room <laughs> kind of gen X whatever um, they, they move jobs every two years or, or less um, I can say with, with a stamp of cert certainty that nowhere that I've worked the people move jobs every two years they, they've stuck around, you know, four or five years. And it's not because of the options, you're waiting for the options to mature or anything. You're actually sticking around because you're happy. You're happy with what you do. You're happy that the company supports you. And you're happy that you know that you're not getting shafted. And if you are getting a more or less harmonized salary, you're happy to know that this is the best you're going to do in said country, that you don't have to, you know, move or do anything weird. So it's kind of like a drug, actually. You've got, you know, you've got now the best, best variant of said drug, possibly. I mean, salaries are like a drug, right? Anyway, like people use them like a drug. You get them, you spend them. Yes, question. I'm gonna drop in on this. <laughs> I, I've got like 15 employees spread around the world, and exactly what you're talking about. I actually pay on the lower side, but I have high retention as in most of my folks are working their way through the three to five years. It's like you know right away that somebody's not going to work out the gym on the first 90 days or so. Oh yeah, the first 90 days are crucial. You'll definitely know if they're not going to work out then. Yeah, you better just get rid of them. You know, help them out. You know, uh, but really what he's talking about is right on target. So it took my company a few years to kind of figure it out, but really, you're on it. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely, that, oh yeah, first, so in addition to OKRs, the first 90 days are your probationary period. I think that's pretty standard anywhere, even if you're remote. No, it's not standard anywhere? No, sorry, oh. that's cultural. I was saying, oh. say yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think that, that goes without saying. If you're going to pay someone, you pay them for three months and you watch them like a hawk for those three months. But you don't want to watch them like a hawk when they need your hand for everything because Remote worker can't need your hand for everything, especially across time zones. So in, in a remote, like in your experience with remote companies, like what does that onboarding process look like? It's like during those 90 days, it's a two-way street. Absolutely. So within those 90 days, you definitely want to make sure that you've already spoken to one, you've got your manager set to have a one-on-one -on -one weekly. That's, that's clearly important. We usually assign a buddy of some sort. That buddy will probably not be from your department, but maybe a very helpful person from another department. Usually they're always helpful people who love to onboard people. And that's the sort of person that, you know, so that's the person you look up to and say, hey, you know, I, I need to do this expense report. Like, do you know how to do that? And they can, t they can point you to that sort of thing. So that's the first 90 days. Um, in the first 90 days, those OKRs, you still set OKRs, you still wait for those weekly reports, and then you, you produce. And typically, uh, I, I would say that, you know, by 60 days, you already know if the person is going to stick around or not. And it, it obviously helps if they've worked at home before. Then you know that they're going to continue doing a good job. If they haven't worked at home before, then you really do monitor for the first 90 days. But if they, if they survive even the first month, of, and it's your first gig working at home, I'm, I'm more or less certain that everything will be okay. The first two weeks are going to be slow because they'll probably have to buy a new laptop or, and whatever. But I don't expect them to tell you something like, oh, I need to get a new internet connection. I mean, uh, I, I find that hard to believe. So, yeah, onboarding. Uh, you, you give them a good onboarding packet. You don't see them even in the first 90 days, possibly. I mean, it's not that lucky that you, you have a company meeting or a team meeting that syncs with someone's being hired. But it also helps to hire everyone on the same day <laughs> so that they go through a batch. So, that they, so if, if five people joined on March 8th, for example, that, that, that batch will go, they'll do things together, they'll learn things together so they can help each other out as well. That, that is useful if you're going to hire in numbers. Don't hire them as and when you feel like it. I think having maybe, like in, like in Procona size where we have maybe about 180 people, we do, we do it twice a month. So that not only you have a, a buddy, but you also have each other as buddies. And you can learn new things from your new colleagues. Yep. Question. I mean, I'll be the last question. Okay, that'll be the last question. How do you uh, solve operation help companies like the differences between different people? Because culturally they're very different sometimes. 
Yeah, so culturally, you, conflicts may be different. You're absolutely right. So like if you know, a German person who is very much into writing documentation and making sure things happen in a, in a process versus say, say a Malaysian person or, or, or a Singaporean person where we're a bit more chilled out, you know, where we, we, know thing, we know how to do things, we know how to get things done, but we're not going to say it has to be methodol methodological. And that's, that's, a, that's a give give and take from both sides, right? So, you know, you don't want one person complaining to your manager, hey, you know, this guy is completely lazy and you saying that that person's got something, you know, stuck up somewhere. You don't want that either. So clear communications, uh, have a conflict management policy, obviously, in place, but also getting getting both people to sort of harmonize with each other, like, why does this guy need everything done in a method, methodological fashion? And why does this person need to be so free and easy all the time? Can there, can there be a middle ground where you learn how to work with different people? And I think that also comes with maturity, right? So you don't, you don't hire a 20-year-old who would be mature enough possibly at that time, no offense to 20-year-olds, but who would be mature enough to say, look, that 40-year-old that who is telling me, like, I need to follow, follow doing X, Y, Z will actually is actually not a bad thing, maybe. But you, at 20, you, you think the world is infallible, right? Like, I can do what I want to do. And sometimes it takes some time for you to realize you can do what you want to do, but it also doesn't hurt to sometimes have some kind of framework. And cultural differences always exist. I mean, we, we've, had, we've been on call, I've been on calls where people say things like, that person's absolutely lazy. That's not, that's not productive, but we need to know why you think the person's lazy. And the person may not be lazy, and you know it's just getting people back to to equilibrium, so to speak. So conflict management is a lot about good leadership and good policy. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you.